golden text. Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, that they may bring the causes unto God. That's Exodus 18 and 19. Problems, problems, they had many problems, and the word had come to Moses' mind as they continued on their wilderness journey. At first, all of the other matters were swallowed up in the amazing wonder of their delivery from Egypt. The ten miracles that God performed in the eleventh miracle at the Red Sea. The twelfth miracle that he gave them water from the rocks. And then the thirteenth miracle where he brought down manna from heaven. And then the fourteenth miracle where he gave them quails from the sea to feed them. This is what God had done. And now after all of this, they had no more worries. They didn't no longer have to worry about their babies being dashed against the rocks in a desperate attempt by the Egyptians to keep their numbers from spreading. But after the first flush of enthusiasm wore off, questions began to arise from the abrasive life of constant movement through a hostile landscape. The people had to live in tents or brush huts. They were not yet able to settle down. Questions and problems probably arose such as who took what place in the line of march and who was going to be what. And we must understand that no laws had yet been given. We do not read of the synodic revelation until during and after the 20th chapter of Exodus. Thus it came about that Moses, who was regarded as their leader, was asked to rule upon a multitude of 600,000 men beside women and children on a day-to-day -day basis on disputes that naturally arose from many thousands living in an unnatural and strained habitation. Healing, adultery, tail-bearing, rowdiness, doubtlessly had to be dealt, dealt with as well. And it was becoming an overpowering task for Moses to settle the disputes that arose in, and then he could not handle them. And let's look at our lesson today. And it came to pass on the morrow, on the morrow, that Moses set to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. Moses had served as a prophet in revealing God's will for the liberation of his people and in proclaiming messages from God to them and to Pharaoh. He was now acting as a judge. When we think of the many thousands of Hebrews and the many matters that needed decisions, it's a little wonder that the demands on Moses' time and energy were certainly overwhelming. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning until evening. You know, after all, let's look at it. Often people coming in from the outside can see the realities of a situation much better than those that are involved. That's why it's never really good to get somebody counsel from somebody that's involved in the situation. You need an outside view. The need to settle disputes and to give guidance to a people suddenly thrust into a new and unusual situation had only slowly become apparent. The fact that this was now a task for ever-increasing dimensions was being graphically illustrated every day. And Moses' father-in-law at once saw the complications and he saw the solution. He began to, uh, by inquiring why Moses was tied up all day long. You're the leader, why should you be tied up all day? He was interested to learn how Moses regarded the situation in which he had become involved. One can seldom help another out of an unfortunate predicament unless the one that's in it perceives to be such and understands why it developed in the first place. Then the 15th verse says, And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people came unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do not, do not and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Okay? The statue of God and his laws. Since as yet there was no uh, codification of God's law for the people, Moses must have reference to the principles of right and justice on which he based his decisions. God must have spoken to him. And God apparently had revealed those principles to Moses, which he tried to teach and enforce with fairness. His decisions appear to have been accepted by the people. And... As has been noted, the revelation of God's law for his people had not yet been given. The Synetic Code would include detailed regulations concerning civil as well as religious matters. 
And it appears that until then, the people's knowledge of the will of God involving these matters solely dependent on the knowledge of Moses. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the thing that thou doest is not good. Okay? He finds a solution. I will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Jethro could see that this dawn to dust schedule could not be long continued. It was Moses, 80 years old. How in the world can you survive from sunup to sundown counseling people? No one speaks to us more bluntly and frankly than our relatives and our in-laws. Moses had become accustomed to being the final authority. He's described as being very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Very fact, the very fact that his judicial authority seemed to be unquestioned was itself a very flattering evidence of his power over the people. But Jethro was in a position to offer advice about a situation that he realized was getting out of hand. He had taken Moses in as a homeless stranger and allowed him to become part of his family. Probably few others could have received so ready a hearing from Moses as his father-in-law. Jethro knew him, okay? Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, that they may bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Jethro mentions the second part of the work of the one who stands between God and men, namely to present to the people the general guidelines that God would give to him to give to the people. Moses did just that when the Sinaitic Code was revealed by God through Moses. As necessary as judges are in the life of any society, Jethro could see that Moses' greatest role in Israel was not that of a reconciler of differences among men. Jethro seems to be saying in this and the following verses that Moses' principal function should be as the intermediary between God and the people. The first element of this function would involve Moses coming to God with the causes of the people and learning from God the principles by which they were to be determined. The 21st verse gives us the specific organizations as we lead into it. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. What is he saying? The final decision is up to Moses. But you know, the problem that you must look at is that many times you put people in authority that don't know how to handle it. You tell people, don't do this and don't do that unless you clear it with me. That's like pouring water on the duck's back. Some folk gonna do what they wanna do, don't care what you say. You mean inch, they take a mile. Here, Jethro was trying to give Moses the right way to do. Moses had to find people that were justifiable and people that would have the hearts of the people in their heart. From the qualifications that are listed, we see that Jephro was a man of wisdom and perception. And the selecting process, which Deuteronomy, the first chapter in the 13th verse suggests, was left to the people, when it was to be done with care. Each person that was to be chosen was to be one of ability. Specifically then, each one was to be God-fearing, truthful, and above corruption. Not a covetous individual who might be susceptible to bribery. The word ruler here is used in its dual significance of leader and judge. The general idea was to spread the authority for the settlement of disputes among many people. There was to be a graduation of authority so that some had the final say in questions involving 10 persons. Others were courts of appeal among 50. Some for 100 and others would be the final arbitrator among a thousand. Doubtless almost all local 
and limited disagreements could be best understood and handled by the persons having responsibility for only 10 individuals. Let them judge the people at all seasons. It was intended that this should serve not as a temporary expediency, but as a permanent tribunal. It should be in session whenever and wherever Israel would encamp. But this division of responsibility would reserve final authority in all major decisions for Moses, giving everyone assurance that he was still in charge. Understand what I'm saying? The final decisions were given by Moses. The final authority in all the major decisions was by Moses. If thou shalt do this thing, the 23rd verse, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Okay? And they judged the people in all seasons and hard cases, the hard cases they brought unto Moses. But every small matter, they judged themselves.